Good morning, Vait coronavirus community. Here we are again um, with another amazing guest um, to discuss what learning uh, and teaching are going to look like um, as much as we can suppose in the current climate. It's really exciting today. We've got Sarah Tacey, who is the head of English at Virtual School Victoria. So a an environment that has an incredible amount for us to think and learn um, from at the moment, particularly, and I know she's been in high demand since um, since we've been in this situation. So we're really lucky to speak with her today. So good morning, Sarah. Oh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity. I think um, a lot of people don't know very much about Virtual School Victoria, but people are starting to learn, and most of the teachers out there probably just know that they might have students at their school who are doing a subject with us or they might have had students from their school who've left and have ended up coming over to us for whatever reason so I like to talk about the school as much as possible and get the word out about what we're doing and share hopefully some of the things that could be useful. Absolutely and I had a visit already arranged with you I was going to come and actually see you in person prior mm. to this all happening but I spoke with you and um, some other educators from your uh, school uh, just last week. I don't know. Time has lost all meaning to me. <laughs> I think it was two weeks ago now, but yeah, it does time is um, doing some strange things at the moment. <laughs> um, and I, what I was so interested to hear you all reflect on, um, and particularly your role as a leader in that setting, was about. I guess the pedagogical framework that you have um, been forging at Virtual School Victoria. And I really wanted to, I guess, pick your brain about some of those issues as we move into really thinking about what teaching and learning will look like in term two. One of the things that you spoke about in that meeting was this idea of the kind of expectations that you have of learners in your um, classroom and in your classes and how that is perhaps different to what people are used to in a face-to-face -face sort of traditional classroom setting. So what does that mean for you at Virtual School Victoria? Well, I think it just means when the students are brand new to us that it is going to take time for them to work in our system and that to begin with we don't expect them to come in ready to just start doing masses of work because really it's not going to happen. Um, we do work with some of the really vulnerable students in the state so people that don't know much about us might not know that the majority of our enrolment cohort are actually with us for social and emotional reasons. So students who've had anxiety, depression, um, may have been bullied. We do have a number of transgender students, students on the autism spectrum who can have all kinds of issues that go along with that often also it can be anxious and depressed. So we have to have all of that in our heads with our students. And even though our cohort's probably quite different to most bricks and mortar mainstream schools, I think um, it's important for the teachers to know that it's the same in a way and that you don't want to have your expectations too high at the beginning. It's going to take adjustment for everybody. Um, I think the students that we have, even though they've been learning online for some of them for quite a while, they're still reaching out and saying, how is this situation going to change things for us? And particularly the year 12s. And at the moment, one of the answers that we have to give them is we just don't know. Um, in the media in the last day or two, I'm sure you've been following the discussions around, should we have an ATAR? Should we have exams? When will they be? Will we all be working through summer to get kids ready for them we don't know so I'm just being very honest with the students and saying that we don't know what the deal is and I think honesty is a really important thing as well um, but just being really realistic in that it could be an adjustment so a lot of students are used to having use over their shoulder in the classroom coming around and motivating them or even just prodding them verbally you know get back on task and you're not going to have that anymore um, all day every day you're going to have a bit of distance between you and your students so you have to allow for their adjustment to that and their lack of motivation which will wane um, and will shift so we all think that English is the most important subject we'd love students to be doing English work first and getting it out of the way and being organized but if they've got assessments in other subjects they're going to sometimes put English on the back burner for a bit that's just how it is so we have to also be aware that for our students they're not always that good at prioritizing and they're not always that good at managing their time without someone helping them with that. So you might need to actually have a conversation with them about managing their time. And it might be, you know, the role of one of the teachers or a group of teachers at your school to actually think about that pastoral care side of things. Um, at our school, we have learning advisors. So each student has 
if they're enrolled full time with us, a learning advisor. We have 12 students that we look after in our learning advisor group as teachers. And it's our job to kind of be that person to help them with that adjustment to the virtual learning environment. Um, I think one other thing that can be really good is having a really clear goal for the week. So not masses of, you know, here's all the terms work at once. That's just going to be intimidating, but checklists of tasks set out week by week. Um, thinking about what the student will actually be able to do without you there, without your support. Maybe some tasks that are self-directed with instructions for them to work through, but also resources to help them if they get stuck. So rather than them just giving up, you want them to be able to maybe go and watch a video or listen to something like a podcast to give them some ideas. Here's a website you could look at to help you with this task or this page of your textbook could be useful. So little prompts. I think um, can be really helpful as well. So I guess that's a bit of an overview of how the realistic expectations um, thing sort of works for me. Um, yeah, I guess that answers it, I hope. <laughs> it more than answers it, there was so much there. I think that sense of, um, I guess, the broader expectations that are about the learner as a whole um, and what they're going through. Obviously, young people have, as you outlined with a lot of the young people you work with, um, a myriad of issues that are not going away mm. um, during this time period. And then we add the global pandemic on top of that. And undoubtedly, many of the young people around the state um, will not have you know, will have had a parent or a family member out of work, they may have contact with illness, that, you know, there's such a rich layer on top of their learning that I think, as you've just said, it's important to foreground for educators. The other thing that, that was really um, interesting in what you were just speaking about was the way it translates to your, I guess, lesson and unit design. Um, the idea that there needs to be some clarity around, I guess, the key skills or the key concepts that um, students are engaging with and that, that may be different to what it would be if you were in that bricks and mortar classroom um, because it requires that level of independent capacity that you were talking about. Is that something that you've had to experiment with as you've gone through your time at Virtual School Victoria? Um, hugely, yes. We actually do have some time sometimes, if we're lucky, at the end of the year to tweak the course that we've been teaching. Um, often, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're sort of, um, we're not planning our full 50 minute periods in the way that a bricks and mortar school would be but we're doing a lot more assessment and individual feedback with our kids in our teaching time but we are always trying to refine our courses and every year we sit down as, as a team and think about what's worked and what hasn't and what was really hard for the kids to get on their own what extra help would they need? So for an English example of that, um, we've just finished, we actually do language analysis first in our course. And I know some, some teachers might listen to this and think, but that's a really difficult, concept why do you do that first and we've had that chat at my school as well and we have to because we don't we have kids that come on board in February they're not going to have read nine days or like a house on fire we can't just make them read a whole novel in two weeks and hey let's start let's do an essay that's not going to work so language analysis is something they can come to without having read a whole text it gives them that time to read the text on their own multiple times we hope so I think part of the planning is that's something we've learned you can't we can't start with a large text and expect every student to have read it and even some students won't know what the texts are they won't know they're going to be our students perhaps some of them even transfer mid-year or mid-semester if things at their school don't work out although that tends to happen more in year 11 than year 12 so we have to have a course that has that flexibility built in um, yeah, I'm trying to remember what your question was now. I think that kind of answers it. We do, yeah, we do change as we go. We have to. Um, so we think about in language analysis what the kids struggled with, the argument and language analysis the last couple of years. And we put in more models of what we would like students' to, responses to look like, more scaffolding um, in the course. So building up from some basic analytical skills with briefer pieces or with a cartoon and then building that up into an essay type response over the weeks um, using lots of videos explaining the structure of essays for them that are self-paced so they can go back and watch the videos again um, putting in annotated sample essays into the course so all of those things some students look at all of it and other students will just look at the bits of it that they might need at that point but you can always push them towards those things if you need them there. So we're always adding and building on what we have. And we do rewrite our courses from scratch when there's a study design change. So we're sort of planning for that for, 
potentially next year, assuming that VCAR doesn't change their schedules, but we don't know. So um, when we are writing that new VCE study design over the next couple of years in our course, we'll think about what we've learned from the current one, depending on what the changes are as well. Absolutely. And it sounds, I mean, obviously a, a lot of the reading that I'm sure those of us who are not so familiar with this style of education have been doing has focused on this idea of the benefits of synchronous learning versus asynchronous learning. And I mean, I, I, I certainly could be reading what you're saying wrong, but it sounds like that combination of the two um, ways in which you can engage with students sort of in real time, whether it's through feedback or discussion, mm. but also ways students can go away and reinforce their learning at their own pace, access materials that might allow them to, um, you know, access more scaffolding that they need, for example. Um, is, is, am I reading that right? Is that yes. the sort of balance... Yeah, our school, um, that's pretty much a key principle of what we do because a lot of our students, especially the ballet or the sports performance kids, they can't be available all day in a school day. So we need to have things that they can do and work through without a teacher guiding them. But they can always ring us up and get some help on the phone or come to the online lesson or we record the lessons so the students that miss them can watch the recording. Um, we don't run a whole week of lessons. So we'd have for Year 12 English one lesson. We take turns in the team to run it and it supplements or supports the weekly tasks that the students are completing. So we might explore one of the tasks that we've set in that lesson if it looks particularly tough. So for example, when we move to our creative response on the Kate Kennedy stories, we'll probably look at different ways of unpacking details of character or maybe setting Kennedy's writing style in the lesson and that will tap into whatever the weekly tasks or the SAC draft will involve um, but really that balances out with what the students are doing in the self-paced mode so they work through a sequence of tasks in our course and in it, we're kind of lucky at the moment because our online courses are all written there ready to go but I think probably what other teachers could learn from that is the structure of it so not having too much text on a page is sort of a key principle for us um, balancing out the text with visuals so diagrams or images so film stills in the module that we teach for Charlie's Country and Tracks we use lots of film stills to illustrate key points um, so we try and we think about the structure of the, the the asynchronous material and content we do have a learning specialist who that's sort of her role with the new courses and she also can look at our existing courses and give teachers ideas around that we try and have some self-marking pieces in there not so many in english but in other subjects there might be quizzes that are self-marking so the teacher doesn't have to correct everything and they can just look at the summary of how the student's gone overall so you could use something like kahoot i know there's lots of online quizzes tools um, that you could use for that sort of thing so yeah that's a, a good sort of um, I guess way to do maybe more of the year 7 to 10 English than VCE but yeah something where the teacher doesn't have to do the correction could be could be useful um, for the teacher as well even if the setup takes a while so yeah balance I think is probably the key the key part is that they might only be doing an hour and a half synchronously in English over a week and the rest of it will be them working at their own pace um, and the synchronous work might be a phone lesson where we might have a half hour chat about if the kids got questions you might just sit there and talk to them about the weekly work or it could be um, a video feedback for the student that you're making and the student can watch that as well or yeah the actual lesson itself is probably the the main one so yeah a bit of a balance of everything um, well, you've really already touched, um, I was going to ask you a little bit more about feedback, but you have um, covered a lot of that already. So you've talked mm. about, you know, there are those more immediate sort of sent, sort of um, feedback tools like quizzes and things that are mm. useful, um, particularly in the junior years. Uh, as you just said, you provide video feedback that the students, you know, for some tasks, I'm assuming that the students can then go back over. Are there any other mm. feedback tips or tools that you think will be useful for people to think about in terms of how they're engaging with their students' work over the coming weeks? Um, I think I saw one really interesting comment on the VCE English mailing list about a teacher asking about using iPads to mark up work. Um, our LMS, which is our online system, we are able to mark up directly on the page, which is really handy. So there's annotation, highlighting, 
um, you can change the color of your highlighting, you can have different colored little speech boxes. So if you don't have anything that fancy, then the review tool in Word is fantastic and can do a lot of those things. You can use highlighting in Word in different colors. So you're almost training the students in how you're going to mark up their work for the first few weeks and then they'll get used to it. So don't be afraid to try that out and see if that works for you. So we do tend to also write on their work directly um, and the screencasting complements that. So they could look over that as many times as they want. Um, I guess too, I worked with a colleague once who's now an assistant principal at a different school. When I was at Laylor, he was um, teaching 12 English with us and he had a really good rule of thumb of not overloading students with too many things to look for in their work. And I think in the online space, that's been something that's really helped. Um, when I am going through a screencast, I'm not picking out every spelling mistake or every, um, sorry, that's just my husband opening the door and closing it again when he realised <laughs> that I was busy, the cat might have been trying to come in. Um, so um, yeah, I think you, you have in your head a few things you want to point out. So it might be, I really need to tell them about the structure of this. I need to tell them about how this particular um, character in the text, they might not have discussed that well, or I might like them to look at how they've in implemented um, using quotes or maybe haven't done it that successfully. That's a key point. So three or four key things and really focusing on those. And also in the, in the screencast, talk about what you want them to keep doing. So I want you to keep doing this. I think um, we were involved in a study. I was I think I've sent you this as a resource yeah, and this yes. as well from Monash Uni last year. And they looked at um, different video feedback in the tertiary setting and then started to do that with schools as well. So the person who worked with us was Dr. Mike Phillips and Professor Michael Henderson um, was his colleague. And Mike was very generous with his support for us around what we were doing, but gave us some of the academic understanding behind why he would use a particular structure. So he talked about having a greeting, making it personal for the students in the video. Um, he talked about saying what you want them to keep doing and um, yeah, and not having an overload of information. So our screencast videos might be three to, to seven minutes, I think is sort of the guide frame that they gave us. So we don't want to have a 15 minute video where they might switch off um, and we want to keep it focused on the key points. And the tool that we use is Screencast-O-Matic because we've got a, a institutional subscription. It's not overly pricey, but I'd definitely be asking your school about what tools they feel would be good if you did want to try that. Mm, absolutely. And I think all of those principles of good feedback that you're talking about are things that people may be used to doing in different contexts, but haven't really thought about how they're going to adapt online. So I think that's really, really, really great um, for you, you to share that work and the academic basis of that work is really, really valuable. I want to finish in a moment by asking you for any last tips. But before I do that, um, I just wanted to, to pick out one of the really great threads through what you've been talking today, which is about maintaining that connection with students. And that even though we're operating in this remote space at the moment, it's that connection that is the basis of learning. Um, and looking for ways, whether it's as simple as providing a greeting at the start of a video that you're making for students, that I think is really important and something that obviously is really key to your work at Fletcher School Victoria. So, any last tips? Uh, well, I think probably the main tip would be just try things out. And if they fail, that's okay. Um, I think for, it's, it's something we're all working with and learning together at the moment, everybody. So when I started at VSV, I think it was quite a steep learning curve. And there was a sense that you can try stuff and it's okay if maybe it didn't work the first time. So I think there's a huge um, benefit to just playing around with different tools and finding ones that you feel comfortable with and having a go and seeing if they work or not. Um, in terms of the specific English course, I actually had a colleague reach out before asking for some ideas around how we teach argument and language analysis because for her, that's her next topic that she's teaching at her large secondary school out in the eastern suburbs. So I think I'll have a phone chat with her sometime around it. But um, I think in English, having sort of steps towards the big picture in mind. So think about your sequence of weeks, what you want the students to be able to do at the end. Um, I think a lot of the VCE students that we teach haven't had a really nice sequence of your seven to 10 
that's been consistent. We've got students with lots of gaps in their understanding and knowledge. And if we can get them through, then and usually um, I think every teacher can sort of forgive themselves a bit if they feel like I'm not doing the best job at the moment. Um, yeah, we have students that have had a really tough time of school and we have to try and get them through year 11 and get them ready to sit some exams if they want to, year 12. And um, I think that for a lot of them, it's really challenging. Some of them haven't read a novel at very for a long time. They come to year 11 and here's a novel that you're going to be studying. And just the idea of it being a novel can be confronting. So I think that the students probably you're working with don't have maybe those same issues. They're probably in some cases a bit more self-directed perhaps than ours can be. Um, they've got to have balance in their lives as well. So they probably have family things going on and they'll be trying to keep themselves you know as sane as they can be in this this time so um yeah i guess the personal connection is important there too to acknowledge what other things the students might have going on in their lives um yeah i think that's probably everything at the moment um, um, yeah, probably yeah. something i'll think i'll think of something in an hour and go oh i should have said <laughs> that but that's okay <laughs> oh, there is just so much um for english educators and really educators more broadly and what you've said today so Thank you so very much for taking some time out of what technically should be holidays. <laughs> That's um, okay. Nice and to share your expertise. Um, we really, really appreciate it. So thank you again. Oh, no problem, Ernest. And thanks for the opportunity. And if anyone wants to get in touch and ask anything, feel free to reach out and get in touch and ask. I'm on the English mailing list. So if you put the call out on the VCE mailing list and ask, then I'll chip in with the support that I can. Fantastic. Thank you so much again. No problem. Thanks.